Welcome to this uh, further evidence session of the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee as part of our inquiry into disinformation and <coughs> fake news. I'd like to welcome uh, Christopher Wiley and Paul Olivier de Hay uh, to the committee to give evidence this morning. Um, before we start the committee session, I would just like to give an update on the invitation of the Select Committee to Mark Zuckerberg to give evidence before us. Um, we believe, given the serious nature of the allegations that have been made around the uh, access and use of Facebook user data, that it is appropriate that Mark Zuckerberg should, should give evidence to the committee. Um, he has suggested uh, that Chris Cox, the Chief Product Officer at Facebook, uh, could come to London to give evidence to, to the committee in the first week after the Easter recess. Uh, so we'll be very happy to invite Mr Cox to give evidence. However, we would still like to hear from Mr. Zuckerberg as well. Uh, we will seek to clarify with Facebook whether he is available to give evidence or not, as that wasn't clear from our correspondence. And if he is available to give evidence, then we will be happy to do that either in person or by video link, if that would be more convenient for him. Um, if they're any happy to answer any further questions about that after the hearing, but uh, um, that is all we'd like to say on that at this time. Um, we we'll turn now to the evidence session this morning. Um, if I could ask um, Chris Wiley first, um, as you know, a lot of uh, um, the committee's work over the last few weeks has been looking at the role of Cambridge Analytica in the data an analytics business and their campaigns, and we heard evidence from Alexander Nix a few weeks ago. Um, perhaps you could, for the benefit of the committee and the record, just explain how you first became involved with Alexander Nix and Cambridge Analytica. Sure. So um, I first uh, joined SCL uh, Group, which is the parent company of Cambridge Analytica, actually before Cambridge Analytica existed in June 2013. Um, I got introduced to him uh, through a mutual contact uh, that I had worked with uh, previously in UK politics. Um, <coughs> The firm uh, SCL had an opening uh, for a research director um, be in part because the past research director uh, died in his hotel room in Kenya um, when he was working for Uruhu Kenyatta. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. Um, part of the reason why I got uh, chosen to become research director is because they were the firm was looking to expand uh, its digital capacity um, and and sort of keep up with developments that were happening, particularly on the military side, um, looking at how information spreads online and um, developing uh, new IP that they could then, you know, pass on to clients, whether that's political or military. Does that answer yes, the question? Absolutely. Yeah. And. Um, could you just talk again for the record, just explain how long you uh, were, worked at, at and with Cambridge Analytica and what caused you to leave the company? Sure. So um, when I started in, in June 2013, um, Cambridge Analytica didn't exist yet. So uh, my t and it's important for people to understand that you know Cambridge Analytica I I is more of a concept or a brand than anything else because it doesn't actually have employees. It's all SCL. It's just the front-facing company for the for, for the United States. Um, but I uh, I started at SCL Group in June 2013. Um, I in July 2014. That's when I told Alexander Nix that I didn't want to continue uh, working at at then at the time Cambridge Analytica. Um, Although I, I uh, scaled down my work until the uh, 2014 midterms, um, so uh, so a year and a, a year and a bit, a year and a half, um, and it, Cambridge Analytica, just to be clear, was set up in large part because of the research that I was doing at SCL Group. So mm -hmm. it was it was a, a, the the IP that we were creating. Um, was acquired by Robert Mercer and Cambridge Analytica became the vehicle to sort of acquire the IP. Yeah. Um, how, would you, how would you, you said that, that, then that Cambridge Analytica doesn't have any employees, that effectively they're all employed by SCL. Yeah. yeah. I mean, how would you 
characterise the relationship between these different companies? I mean, is it in effect one organisation that exists behind different different facades? Yeah, I mean, so Cambridge Analytica was set up in part because, first of all, it it there was. Um, so the, the way it works is CA was set up and um, SCL Elections, which is um, part of SCL Group, which is a group company, SCL Elections uh, became a minority shareholder and then Robert Mercer became the majority shareholder of Cambridge Analytica. Um, SCL then assigned its intellectual property to Cambridge Analytica and then Cambridge Analytica licensed back the IP to SCL Elections. Uh, and then also granted SCL elections an exclusivity contract whereby all projects from Cambridge Analytica uh, would, would be given to SCL to work on, although the actual contracting on the client-facing side would be with Cambridge Analytica. Partly that was because in the United States there's particular rules against um, uh, foreign actors in elections, so having an American company was beneficial f for that purpose. Um, also, Robert Mercer's lawyers were concerned about um, two things. Firstly, the optics of acquiring a UK military contractor to work in American elections. Optically, that you know wouldn't necessarily play well. And and secondly. Um, they were concerned about uh, some of the history of the shareholders in the company as well as some of the past projects they'd worked on. It, it, the company being SCL? SCL, yeah. yeah. So Cambridge Analytica was a kind of um, a, 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 a company set up with the, with the purpose of doing political work in, in America? In the United States with, with a new brand that was sort of untainted by any history or legacy of, of, of past projects or shareholders. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people will um, say, and I'll say, um, that given that you're someone who worked very closely with these people uh, for a period of time and understand this world very well and have you know, built your career working in it, why have you decided to speak out against it and give evidence against people who used to be your colleagues? Um, because, you know, as a citizen, one is expected and has a duty to report unlawful activity. Um, if in terms of if you're asking about sort of my journey to this moment. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people have asked me, why is it taking you so long? Um, what they don't see is that actually um, I've been working on this uh, with The Guardian uh, and then later The New York Times and Channel 4 for a year. Um, so what you're seeing is the, sort of the, the, the apex or the climax of that. But this is um, a year-long uh, coming out process. But before going public, you know, I went and started working with uh, the ICO and UK authorities to start their investigation. Um, also, uh, you know, after I left uh, Cambridge Analytica, <clears throat> very shortly after that, I got uh, threatened with legal action um, and had, you know, a very aggressive team of lawyers uh, coming after me. So I signed um, an undertaking of confidentiality. Which would mean that if I did break that, uh, you know, I could be sued into oblivion by Robert Mercer. Um, so, frankly, that's intimidating. Um, but more, more broadly, you know, it was only until 2016 when I was when I was working at CA and setting it up. You, you don't, you don't appreciate the, the future impact of what what your work is until it starts to happen. And so 2016 was, you know, where I started looking at what this company was actually doing in the United States and, you know, coming to appreciate that the projects that I was working on may have had a much wider impact than I initially anticipated it, it would. Um, and after Donald Trump got inaugurated, very shortly after that, that's when I started working with uh, Carol at The Guardian on, on reporting, um, reporting some of the things that the, that, that the company was doing. So for the first, for the spring, I was one of her key sources anonymously until we could figure out a legal position that would then allow me to come forward. So, so, so you, it would be fair to say that um, you, for you, Donald Trump's election sort of crossed a line. You felt that 
techniques that you were aware of um, had been used and shouldn't have been used in the way they were used during the, during the, during the campaign and, and therefore you felt that, that you felt you had to speak out about it. Would that be a way of characterizing yeah, it? Yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's just because of Donald Trump, but Donald Trump kind of makes it click in your head that this actually has a much wider impact. Um, I don't think that um, military style information operations is conducive for any democratic process, whether it's a US presidential or a local council race. Yeah. So, uh, as well about the relation, when Kim Jong un was, was founded, um, I mean, who, who, um, who do you think sort of in terms of how the algorithm, the, the, the database that uh, Kim Jong Un could work from, was that something it inherited from SCL, or was that something that um, that, you, that you developed, or was it developed no, by other people? No, SCL. Bef this is partly why I was brought on as research director because SCL um, was falling behind uh, in its technical capacity and its in its quantitative, uh, you know, skill set. Um, so it didn't SCL. Um, before I joined, did not have any data assets, um, so that was in large part why I got why I got hired. Um, so it was the it was the Ripon project that actually scales, you know, acquired you know data and scaled it. Um, that it was at that moment where they started becoming more focused on on on, on data science and machine learning. Because well, this is true. I've seen a report that the idea, the name Kim Jong Un was Steve Bannon. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, it, because um, it's sort of a bizarre story. So uh, Alexander Nix has his um, sort of standard pitch, um, as it were, and it often relies heavily on you know we have offices in Mayfair and I went to Eton and you know presenting a very sort of posh uh, veneer onto the company, which, you know, when you look at their clientele in a lot of the, uh, you know, it's a lot of developing countries in the Commonwealth, and there's still sort of a, that, that sort of image, you know, plays well with certain types of clients that he had worked with in the past. Problem was that for Steve Bannon, he didn't really care. Um, about that, he was much more interested in, um, you know, going and speaking at student events at Cambridge than, you know, sitting in a posh office in Mayfair. Um, so Alexander realized that and he decided uh, to set up a fake office in Cambridge uh, so that whenever Steve Bannon, who this is before Steve Bannon came, came on board to, to, which, you know, set up a project which eventually became CA. Um, and so whenever um, Ben and Woods would come, we, we set up this, this fake office and to sort of present a more uh, academic side of the, uh, of the company. And it was from that that um, Steve Bannon decided we should call it Cambridge Analytica because of how closely associated it was with the, with the university, because in in his head it was a very academic company. Okay. Did and, and other than that geographical proximity, did did the company have any particular relationship with Cambridge University? It it didn't have a formal relationship, but we did work with a lot of professors at the University of Cambridge, in particular the the, the psychology department and the psychometric center. Okay. So they would do research projects and assist with developing techniques and and feeding yeah. ideas. Yeah. Yeah, um, we, you know, we would we would use um, the the Cambridge has an amazing psychology department. It's one of the top, if not the top, in the world for psychology. So um, it was a real resource to have that very close to us. So we did work with uh, several professors at the psychology department on developing um, psychometric inventories and also looking um, more broadly at the research that was coming out of the university in uh, psychological profiling using online data exhaust. Um, so, you know, a lot of the papers that eventually became um, the, the uh, foundation of the methods that were then used on the Ripon project, um, that all came out of research that was being done uh, at the University of Cambridge, um, some of which uh, was funded in part by DARPA, for example, which is the U.S. military's research agency. And did you just approach 
academics on an ad hoc basis, or was there any engagement with the university authorities or any of the departments? Um, we definitely talked to some of the more senior professors, but it was all, there was no, it was, there was nothing formalized with the university itself. Mm -hmm. So it was all done, you know, professor to professor to professor, but, you know, it, it sort of sat in a gray area. I mean, we, when Ripon was happening, we had a lot of people um, who we were engaging um, at Cambridge who provided, you know, uh, who played a pivotal role in actually getting that, that project going. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Paul Farrelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, essentially, your, your central motivation has been that you're rather aghast that uh, uh, techniques uh, in the social <coughs> media world that have been used for military uh, psyops purposes uh, are being used in, in the political domain. I mean, that, that's, that's a part of it. Um, I think also more broadly when you look at, um, you know, how Cambridge Analytica operates or how SCL operates, um, you know, they, they don't care whether or not what they do is legal as long as it gets the job done. So it's not, it's not there's been a lot of focus on the data side of things and there's been a lot of focus on, um, on targeting, but more broadly, this is a this is a company that goes around um, the world and undermines civic institutions of, you know, countries that are struggling to develop those institutions. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why I find the company problematic. Um, it's not just the it's not just the data. It's also more broadly that they are, uh, you know, an example of what modern day colonialism looks like. Um, you have, you know, a wealthy company from a developed nation going into, um, you know, a, an economy or a democracy that's still struggling to get, you know, its feet on the ground um, and taking advantage of that to profit from that. Uh, so it, there, there's, there's, there's several reasons why I find the company problematic. So do, do they sort of like to have an aura, do you think, of uh, being the smash of, uh, of the modern digital age? The smash, smash. It's a James Bond, uh, the the the, uh, the, evil the evil organization that manipulates things uh, here, there, and everywhere across the world. Um, I, I think you know if you if you watch you know the Channel Four undercover, for example, I think you can see for yourself that they they know that that's the you know the the brand that they present and they cultivate that. Um, I think they they find it amusing. No, I I, I can I, I, I sort of get it, and uh, I didn't quite know what to make of Mr. Mr. Nix uh, when he came to us, apart from that he was a, a corporate financier who sought uh, uh, a sort of a, a higher calling, as he as he almost said it to us. But I, I do remember on, on the Channel Four, one of the most hilarious bits was um, a chap called Mark Turnbull, who got a big plaster on his nose, I think. Mm. Uh, saying that he was a master of disguise. <laughs> he doesn't always have the plaster on his nose. Um, okay. um, there's the, uh, just before, we want to get around uh, onto some of the things that, um, that, that happen in, in different parts of the world, but just before, before we do, um, I, I just wanted to just probe into your, your predecessor who died um, in Kenya. Yeah, was was that? I, I've not heard of that. Working for the Kenyatta campaign. Uh, yeah. Were there any suspicious circumstances? Um, I've heard several different stories as to what actually happened, so um, I don't know which story is accurate. Um, but uh, it it didn't sound. You know, when you work in 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 Kenyan politics or politics in a lot of African countries. Um, if a deal goes wrong, you can pay for it. So is this a matter of public record, or is this, this new now? Um, he, well, Dan, who's my predecessor, he was, it, his death did uh, cause some news coverage in Romania because he was the son of one, a cabinet minister in Romania, who is now in, in jail for corruption charges, I think. But um, uh, so he he came from a political family in Romania. 
So the fact that he died really was news, uh, but uh, the circumstances of his death, I've heard different different stories, so I'm not sure which is... And his name was Dan? Dan. Um, his surname starts with an M. And I, yeah, Dan Neresan. Neresan. Can yeah. you spell that just for that? N-U-R-E-S-A-N. He was working simultaneously in India, I think. And there is also some Simultaneously in, in, in India? Yes. I mean, this, when you look at Facebook's uh, biggest market, um, I mentioned this in the States as well, you know, India is the top in terms of numbers of users, and the, obviously that's a country where, you know, which, is, which is rife with, uh, with political discord and, uh, and opportunities for, um, for destabilization. So, um, that they, they've worked extensively in, in India. They have an office in India. I think that's my, something we might want to pursue, pursue later. But just, 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 just on this point, when you were told that there was a vacancy because your predecessor had died uh, in, in, in Kenya, what explanation did the company give to you of, of that death? Uh, just, to, just to clarify, when I got hired, I wasn't told that my predecessor died in Kenya in his hotel room. Uh, that was several months after when I asked about who was I actually replacing. Um, because I was looking for some old files and I couldn't find. So I did realize that I didn't actually know the name of the person who I replaced. So I asked about, you know, kind of looking through old files was, and that's where it came out that he died. So same question two months on then. What explanation were you given of the? Uh, how old was he? Do you know? Uh, he was in his thirties. Um, do they give you an I, explanation? I, I mean, they did. I, I just if I if I explain it, just if you understand, then it's pure speculation. So sure. it's not. I'm not stating this as a matter of fact. I'm sure. just repeating, you know, what I heard. Um, what I heard was that he was working on some some kind of deal of some sort. I'm not sure exactly what kind of deal it is, but when you when you work for senior politicians in a lot of these countries, you don't actually make money in the electoral work. You make money in the influence brokering, you know, after the fact. Um, and that a deal went sour and again this is what I've been told, so I'm not saying this as a matter of fact, but um, people suspected that he was poisoned in his hotel room. I also heard that um, the police got bribed to not enter the hotel room uh, for 24 hours. Um, but that is what I was told. I wasn't there, so I can't you know, speak to the, the veracity of that account. But that's, that's what I was told. OK, well, well, we'll leave that there for the moment, because there are plenty of journalists who might want to follow some of those interesting leads. Um, yeah. One of the things that um, uh, as, uh, Mr. Nix was at pains to, to um, uh, stress when, when he was in front of us was that you know, there, were, there were different companies, uh, different entities, uh, data uh, uh, could go one way but not another way because of uh, government contracting. Mm. But um, th there was like, one, one name that came up uh, uh, as, as the data control that was common between Cambridge Analytica and SCL just almost demonstrating that you know there were common personnel, notwithstanding the uh, uh, the denials, was was a lady called Jordana Zetta. Do you do you know do you know her? Um, I do not. No, no. So she, it's just a name. It's just a name, but they do put lots of random names on all kinds of things. Okay. Um, there's there's also we've we've just been so I don't know if you've seen that, which is a which is a. A pictogram of, of the of the SCL structure. It's uh, sure. been done by uh, an, an independent journalist, and it's just from filings. It's a company's house, and, uh, and sure. Um, so it's fairly standard, but it's it's, it's fa fairly fairly complicated um, for a, for a relatively small company. I'd wager that there's probably more companies yeah. than even what's on that piece of paper. Um, but there are some interesting sort of names that that crop up. The, the Mr. Nix, we we know about. Um, yeah. Uh, so the Etonian salesman, I think you, you, you almost described yeah. him as. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he uh, my understanding is that the reason why he, Alexander Nix, was involved in SCL was because his father had shares in the company and his father died. He inherited shares or there was some deal that was done um, because he has no background in um, psychology, tech, you know, 
politics, any of the things that they operate in, um, which is which is why he you know he's a he he's a salesman. He likes to sell stuff. Um, uh, and while I was cooking Sunday lunch uh, um, this weekend, I, I listened to a BBC profile of a of Nigel Oakes. Right. Did you come across him? Um, yes, although not day to day. He he. Um, what, so when we were when we were setting up um, Cambridge Analytica, the the reason why it um, one of the reasons why SCL Elections rather than um, either the group company or another entity was the minority shareholder was because Alexander Nix wanted to keep more control for himself, and he was quite paranoid about some of the other shareholders and directors in the in the group company. Um, so. He made a concerted effort to sort of keep this project away from uh, from the others as long as possible. Um, but I, di I did come across him several times. It's just I mean, what I'm saying is that it wasn't day to day. I didn't I didn't work with Nigel Oakes. Mr. Oakes came across as a founding eminence grease. Uh, Sorry, uh, from this profile, Mr. Oakes came came across as the founding eminence grease behind the whole of the the whole project. Uh, no, no, not for Cambridge Analytica. For for, for SCL, yes, so, so. but not for Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica was Steve Bannon, Robert Mercer, and Alexander Nix. You know, most of those negotiations have happened focus. happened in America. They kept it pretty separate from the from the sort of legacy shareholders and directors of SCL. Okay. But he 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 played a pivotal role in actually setting up SCL Group. Uh, so, so. Can I just throw the, the, the role of a couple of other, other people, uh, the, the role of the chairman, Julian Wheatland, uh, yeah. who, uh, and uh, uh, Victor Chengiz. Uh, uh, Which I don't, he, he, they got rid of Chengiz uh, when, when they were finalizing the Cambridge Analytica deal, because the, the Mercer lawyers didn't like Chengiz' involvement, because um, apparently he had fairly sketchy uh, business dealings that they didn't want to be associated with. Okay. And Julian Wheatland, what was his role? Uh, he was, I, I believe, the chairman. So he didn't actually, he didn't sort of do much. Um, he sort of was like the queen of the company, if that means. So, so you, you not, not to, sorry, not to say the queen doesn't do a lot. I'm, I'm sorry, just, that, I don't, don't interpret that as a slight of the yeah. head. Yeah. I'm just putting, putting these other names up in because there's, there's a danger that you one focuses just on, on, on Mr. Nix, who's got a very sinister surname. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the a lot of these a lot of these guys, their role is not actually to do work; it's to do deals. Right, so they don't actually do anything day to day. They're the ones who, you know, because of their family or because of their businesses or, or what have you, just have a very wide network of people, not just here in the UK, but in particular in, in Africa and various developing countries that, um, you know, enable the companies to go and get and get working contracts. So, so their, their roles was, were, were usually like as the introducer, as the deal maker, um, no, not managing the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Would you characterize them as people who wanted to make a fortune out of this, or people who were genuinely curious about the, the, um, the, the, the ability through social media in the digital age to, for them to be able to manipulate outcomes in, in politics? You have to remember that a lot of these people are very wealthy already, so it's not, you know, Alexander Nix in particular, right? Um, there was, there was one time where <clears throat> he had to go and we were running late because he had to pick up a 200,000 uh, pound chandelier. So, so he, he, you know, th th there's, there's, these are people who don't need to make a lot of money. Um, but the thing that I learned is that for certain wealthy people, they need something to keep them occupied and they need projects. And going into the developing world and sort of Running a country is something that appeals to them. Okay, and I've just got one, one, one last question. Um, this, this Sorry, I, uh, didn't, I didn't mean that in a flippant way. If that came across as flippant, Sorry. this this chart has got no mention of the uh, aggregate IQ or SCL Canada as right. as, it, as it styled itself. So what's the what's the relationship between that Canadian company and the rest of the rest of this group? Yeah. So um, very shortly after I. Uh, became research director at SCL, um, and I was sort of given the directive or the mandate to expand 
the company's um, software capacity and technological infrastructure. We obviously needed people to, to do that. Um, so I reached out to people who I'd worked on um, previous projects with who I respected. Um, one of those people was Jeff Sylvester, who is now the CTO of Aggregate IQ. So in the first email that I sent, which I've also passed on to the committee, um, I've, I've passed on several folders of documents. Um, uh, you know, the first email where I tell Jeff um, that I've just become research director, this is what we do, uh, his immediate reaction is you need a Canadian office. So he re replied, you need a Canadian office. Um, when I went to Alexander Nixon and said, uh, there's a couple Canadians that I want to I want to hire, he said, fine, but they have to come here and work in London. Um, so when I talked with Jeff and several other people um, who then later became AIQ, uh, they had they had you know new families, you know, just got a house. Um, it's not it's not easy to just get up and move to a different country when you have young kids, right? Um, so I went back to uh, to Alexander and said, look, they're not mobile, but I think they'd be really helpful because uh, they're, they're really good at what they do. So the compromise was that a Canadian company would be set up. That would en enable the Canadians who wanted to work on the project. At, and keep in mind, at the time, this is SCL. This is before Cambridge Analytica got set up. So primarily, we were focused on uh, projects in the developing world. But. Um, the, the deal was that they would uh, sign an intellectual property license whereby all of the work that they were doing for the company would then be assigned to SCL Group um, and that they would trade, uh, that they would trade as SCL Canada, um, but the, they just, they set up a Canadian entity and that they, the, the legal name was Aggregate IQ. That was also in part because you know, when you work in a lot of countries, sometimes it's beneficial um, to have different, uh, you know, billing names on, on invoices. And, you know, if you're working in a country that has declarable expenses and all of that, True. you can, you can particu particularly if you're trying to get around coordination rules, like in the United States, which have very strict non-coordination rules, if you can actually bill as several different companies, but it's the same team working on it. The paper, the paperwork looks compliant, even if the project okay. isn't. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a Canadian-based shell company, effectively. Yeah, I, I, would, I would sort of call it like a, like a franchise, as it were. Um, so in internal, uh, internal staff documents, so, so for example, this internal staff list, which I've also passed on to the committee, um, AIQ staff are listed under uh, SCL Canada. So inter the internal documents of the company refer to this entity, AIQ, as SCL Canada. Um, as, uh, you know, as I, I've been saying for, for months now, but as has now been validated yesterday by um, uh, Gizmodo, which is a, a, a website that has actually found the code base that AIQ built uh, that, that, that uh, that shows that AIQ actually built um, the Ripon platform for Cambridge Analytica. So there's now tangible proof in the public domain that AIQ actually built Ripon, um, that, which is the which is the software that utilized the algorithms from the Facebook data. Um, I could talk more about some of the other projects that AIQ has worked on. Um, so, for example, uh, Nigeria, the Nigerian project in 2015. Um, that um, uh, that Carol at the Guardian has has touched on in her reporting, <coughs> where uh, the the company utilized the services of an Israeli private intelligence firm. Um, that firm is Black Cube. That's not being reported, although Channel Four has undercover footage that they haven't been able to put into the public domain of Alexander Nix talking about the relationship with Black Cube. Black Cube on the Nigeria project uh, was engaged to hack um, the now president of Nigeria, uh, uh, Buhari, to get access to his medical records uh, and private emails. AIQ worked on that project. So 
aggregate IQ was, <clears throat> was handed material uh, in, in Nigeria from Cambridge Analytica to distribute online. So that's distribution of compromat, and that's also distribution of incredibly uh, threatening and violent video content, which I've also passed on to, uh, to the committee. The, the videos uh, that AIQ distributed in Nigeria with the, the, the sole intent of intimidating voters um, included content where people were being dismembered, where people were having their throats cut um, and bled, bled to death in a ditch. Uh, they were being burned alive. There was, uh, there was uh, incredibly anti-Islamic uh, and threatening messages portraying Muslims as violent. And um, this is, again, the, the, so you've got aggregate IQ, which received 40% of vote leaves funding, also working on projects that, that involved hacked material and compromat and distributing uh, violent videos of people being bled to death uh, to intimidate voters. And this is, this, is, this is the company that played an incredibly pivotal role in politics here. Um, so something that I would strongly recommend to the committee is that they actually uh, you know, push the, not only push the authorities here, but really give them, uh, you know, the, the support that they need in order to actually investigate this company and what they were doing mm -hmm. in Brexit. Mm -hmm.